Hey everyone, it is great to be here in Montreal. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you very much for inviting me. If there is nothing else that you take away from this presentation, I hope it is this, that we have tools that are now available that every developer, no matter what programming language you use, no matter what your skill is at that programming language, and no matter whether you think you are an ML engineer or not, preferably not, we have tools that can revolutionize the programs that you are making available to your customers, to your users, and to the world. Hey, my name's Alan Furstenberg. I'm a software developer and consultant. I'm located in New York. I'm a Google developer expert. I'm a Google Cloud Champion innovator. And what those two mean is that I don't work for Google, but I work closely with Google engineers and their developer relations team to help them understand what we, as developers, need to make our jobs easier, better, and again, make it better for our users. I also am a contributor to the open source LangChain.js project. And we're going to talk a little bit about what LangChain.js is. But in short, it does exactly that. It's an open source project that helps make available for anybody who knows how to write JavaScript, make some of these amazing tools, make some of these amazing language models available for us to use without having to know the details of creating a machine learning model. I'm also the co-host of a podcast called Two Voice Devs. We've been going on for about three years now, and originally we started talking about how tools like Alexa and Google Assistant could be used and could be changed by us as developers. And like the rest of the world, as the LLM craze caught hold, we've been shifting as well. I hold weekly office hours where people who have questions about, originally about how to develop for uh, Alexa, Google Assistant, would come and ask questions. And now how people who are learning or are interested in learning how to use these machine learning models can come and talk about how to incorporate it in their software. The link's at the bottom. Spiders.com is the company that I work for. We're a small consulting company. But a lot of what we do is the same sort of thing. We're helping our clients understand what new tools, and 20 years ago, that was new tools like the web, uh, could do for their business. How they take the business models that they have, the business expertise that they have, and use new technology to make it even better. Prisoner.com is mine, and that's where you'll be able to find links to my social profiles. Probably eventually you'll find a link to this presentation, so forth and so on. So what is the problem? What am I up here talking about? The problem fundamentally is that we have two different entities that we're working with. We have humans on one hand, and as humans, we're analog. We're fuzzy. We like dealing with fuzzy things. But computers aren't. Computers are digital. They like dealing with discrete things, discrete numbers, discrete data structures, things that we can enumerate and reduce on a fundamental level. And historically, that has meant we've had to train humans how to be more like computers. We've had to train people how to write programming languages, how to write spreadsheets, how to write data structures so that the computers can do something with it. We've never had a way around that until now. Now we're flipping the switch. We're making it so that the discrete computers can understand, and I put that very much in quotes, us by using technology that takes the fuzzy notions that we as humans will express, the broad ideas, the general concepts, and turn them into discrete things that we as developers, that we as programmers, that computers themselves know how to work with. And to do that, we need to understand fundamentally what an LLM is and what it is not. And we've had a bunch of presentations so far today that started to talk about those sorts of, sorts of things. But one quote that I particularly like from a friend of mine, Noble Ackerson, he likes reminding us large language models are not a source of truth. A lot of times we'll see people will go in and ask a question to ChatGPT, 
and get the answer and think that that's actually an answer when it is nothing of the sort. It was a statistically generated string of characters that may or may not actually represent what is going on in the world. But one thing that we do know, LLMs are really, really good at transforming things, taking one thing and turning it into another thing. Google, when they came up with this technology, when they invented this technology, invented it to do things like translate from one human language into another human language. And what we've seen over time, over time being the past nine months, what we've seen over time is that it's really good at doing things like taking some text and summarizing that text, taking some text and extracting out of it the relevant pieces of information, the bullet points of it, the keywords of it. One of the things that it's really good at, for example, that we've seen, is that we can take human phrases, phrases in a human language, and turn that into code that can be executed. It's a very popular thing until we see some edge cases there. And then at the same time, we can do the opposite. We can take that structured data. We can take a JSON object or a list of, CSV, of things separated by CSV and turn them into phrases that sound right to a human. When we combine those two capabilities with the APIs that we as developers already know, already understand, and have been working with for decades, then we've just added a new capability to our applications. This is a powerful new tool, a powerful new technique. Uh, a couple of sessions back, you saw a large list of things that can do. This is uh, sometimes known as RHE, or Retrieval Augmented Generation, that I'm going to be talking about today. But what I kind of want you to think about is this big picture of focusing on what are these LLMs good at, and how do they dovetail with the skills that we have to make things even better for everybody. So how are we going to do this? In short, we kind of break it, can break it down into four steps. The first is we're going to get our request from the user. We can get our request in any number of ways, but we're going to get a request from the user. Then we're going to take that request, feed it into a large language model to turn it into that discrete representation, whether that is segments of code, whether that is SQL, whether that is a data structure. Take the LLM with a prompt and turn it into something that we can use. And then we do it. We take that data structure, we take that code, we take that command, we do something with it, and we create another set of discrete results. Then we're going to take those results that we just got, we're going to take the original information from the user, and put them together in a prompt with the instruction of make this, you know, make this sound reasonable. Here's the question, here are some data structures that answer it, turn that into something that I can send back to the user, and then repeat, and repeat, and repeat. Let's look at a couple of quick examples of that. So the user types something into a chatbot. We're all familiar with that at this point, right? The LLM is going to take this, plus some other context. Maybe it's previous parts of the conversation. Maybe it's the current time or date. Maybe it's other things that we know about this user already, like what files they may have. And we're going to turn this into the name of a function call along with whatever parameters may have come out of what they were saying that makes sense in the context of that function name. We're developers, we're used to functions, right? We're then going to execute that function with these parameters and get back a JSON object. We know how to do that, we're developers, we do that all the time. We then take that JSON object and the original question, we ask another LLM, a different prompt to say, format this as a chatbot response. We take the response that it gives it back, send it back to the user, keep repeating the process. Let's look at another example. User says something to their voice assistant. I love this example personally. The LLM takes what the user has said and turns that into something called embeddings. Embeddings are another subject that is a wonderful subject, but it's going to take another hour to go into. Suffice it to say that an embedding is basically a representation, a digital representation, a set of numbers that semantically represent what the user has said. Take that set of numbers, take that embeddings, and go to a vector database and say, hey, what other documents 
are nearby this point in vector space, in you know, 700 dimensions. What are the other nearest documents to there? Take those. Give me the five closest ones of those. Send my original request, those five documents, and ask another LLM to summarize it. Oh, and by the way, send it to me as SSML so I can speak it back out to the user, repeat this as necessary. Let's look at another example. The user asks a question about data to search for or summarize. The LLM takes this question, plus a database schema that they may be querying against, and creates an SQL query according to the prompt. We'll take this SQL query, we'll maybe apply some sanity checks just to make sure they're not trying to delete the database, which would be a bad thing. We execute the SQL, we get the results from the database, you, you can guess it, we take the original request, the results of the database, ask the L another LLM to summarize it, send it back to the user, repeat as necessary. You see the pattern here. We're using two different prompts. One, to take what the human is saying and turn it into a discrete representation. The other, to take a different discrete set of results, plus what the user asked, and turn it into something that the user can understand. But what skills do you need to do this? What's, what's different than what we today, as developers, know and need to know? Well, the first thing is just that. You need your existing skills. You already know how to use APIs. You've got libraries that you're already commanded with. You're, if you're working for a company, you've already got the company's business logic that you are going to be applying, because the LLM knows none of that. You need to learn about LLM prompting and parameters. And you know, if you've been living under a rock for the past nine months, you're unfamiliar with this. But even so, it's something that takes practice and reinforcement. It takes experimentation. Right now, this is more of an art form than it is a science. But fortunately, we have tools that are helping us doing this. So things like the Vertex AI Model Garden and Generative AI Studio that are available in Google Cloud and available to all of you in Canada can help you do this. It's a playground for you to play with prompts and fiddle with them and see how they work. And then, and this is the magic part, this is the part that OpenAI brought to us just a year ago, eh, okay, more than a year ago, is the fact that we can have an API that lets us take that prompt give it to an LLM and get results back. We don't need to tune the models ourselves. We don't need to know any of the expertise that an ML engineer has or needs. And it's this a API, these libraries, that are enabling all of us as developers to have access to these powerful new tools. That's the revolutionary step. So let's look at some of these in a little bit more detail. When I think about prompts and models, they're kind of two two sides to this that we need. On one hand, we need to know what we're doing in a prompt. And while there's not a lot of rules yet, like I said, this is more of an art form still, but generally we found that we can get pretty good results by following a bunch of kind of common steps here. So we want to enter, for example, a role description. We're telling the LLM, who is it pretending to be? Are you pretending to be a database administrator? Are you pretending to be a librarian? We give it some operational context. We might, for example, if we're anticipating the user to say something like, you know, what were the number of uh, sales for the past two days? Well, we need to tell it what today's date is. We need to give it the current date and time. We may need to give it some other operational context of what's going on in the real world that it needs to know more about. We'll need to give it some user-specific context. So if the user said something like, how many sales have I made? Well, who is I? Who is that user? What are the things that we need to be able to provide and include as part of the prompt? We may give it some examples. One of the things that we found with many of these prompts is that if we give just a couple of examples, not too many, so it doesn't bias it too much, but give it a couple of examples so that it knows what the input could look like, and more importantly, what I want the output to look like, it can do a better job at doing that. We may give it a task description. Things like, you're going to be asked a question, I need you to turn this question into an SQL prompt. And then, of course, we need to give it the user inputs. We're going to say, here's, here's what the user has said. And then finally, what I like to call the ask. And that's just a single prompt that says something like answer, or query, or whatever it is. And that's right after that is what we're expecting the LLM to kind of fill in the blank. Because that's how these work. It's predictive text based on 
everything as it's streaming along, and you're saying, okay, here's where you are, you take over the rest. What's, what's the most likely results that we want out of this? So that's what a prompt looks like. On the parameter side, these are the ways that we can kind of modify the model, tweak the model just a little bit. The most obvious one, of course, is we're using different model names. Which model itself are we using? One of the ones that people love to talk the most about is temperature. As if there's, it's this magical value that, you know, if you have a, a temperature close to one, it's going to be inaccurate and it's going to hallucinate a lot. And if you have a temperature close to zero, it's going to be accurate. And that's not exactly how temperature works. Temperature controls randomness. It controls when it's presented with a possible set of next tokens to return, how kind of offbeat does it get? And for some things, we want it to try to be statistically nice and average. And for those, we'll use a low temperature. And in some cases, we want it to be, you know, a little bit creative, but not too creative. We don't want it to make things up completely. And for those, we may use a slightly higher temperature. But this is kind of where the art form comes in, where you need to play with it to see just how well a temperature works in your particular environment for a prompt. We'll also want to, there are other things to include number of tokens to return, how much we're willing to, to let it ramble on and on. Um, usually we don't mess with that too much. We don't need to. For some models, we have a safety filter threshold. Do we want it to always block things that are talking about medical results? In many cases, we do, but in some cases we don't. So we might want to play with that, again, depending on our circumstances. And there's lots of other esoteric parameters that the machine learning people love to talk about and love to illustrate that most of us don't care about. One great way to play with all of these sorts of things is using the Google Cloud Vertex AI Generative AI Studio. Say that five times fast, because I can't. This lets you do things like manually enter the prompt information, save, adjust the parameters, fiddle with it over time, experiment with what the inputs look like, see how well they match the outputs. This lets you do it in a nice, easy, safe, cheap environment before you start deploying things to testing and production. And again, keep experimenting. It's still an art more than a science. We don't have hard and fast ways to do it, things. If something doesn't quite look right, play with it. Try something else. Once we have a prompt, or think we may have a prompt, we need a good way to get that prompt into the LLM itself and then do other things with the results that come back. And this is where Langchain, Langchain.js, and other similar toolkits are beginning to help us out. Langchain likes, likes dividing things into kind of six broad areas where it talks about it. So it offers tools to help us with the prompts. One of the things you've, you've kind of seen is that we're not really dealing with a static prompt. We're not going to send the same prompt every time we're gonna send kind of like a prompt with a boilerplate. So we've got kind of things that need to slot in. It provides the ability to do templating with those sorts of things. There are the models themselves, and this is one of the great things about Langchain, is that many of the language models that are out there today, ranging from OpenAI to Google's Palm models, to Llama2, to you name it, there are tons and tons of models that are now available, all of them under Langchain and Langchain.js, pretty much have the same way to create them, to send a prompt to them, to get results back. So if I want to fiddle with different prompts, different, you know, from different companies, I can do so pretty easily. But in addition, we need to get the data out. Remember, these are, you know, we want to be able to get access to where we've stored data in some cases. When we're dealing with vector databases, we need a standard way to do that as well. And for that, they offer a number of libraries to handle retrieval of that information. When you're dealing with multi-round chatting, where you've got a you know, what, what ChatGPT has very much popularized, all of the current language models really essentially start from zero. Every prompt you send to them is a brand new prompt. Even if you think you're carrying on a conversation, you're not. You need to manage that conversation. And models that Langchain provide under the memory category do that for you, kind of seamlessly in a lot of ways. Finally, one of the most brilliant parts of Langchain and what they're pushing a lot of are what they kind of lump under chains and agents. And this is saying that in many cases, the output of one stage feeds into the input of another stage. And we saw that with our chain of four things. You know, we're taking the output of something and feeding into the input of the next. 
when we're dealing with a template. We're going to take a template, fill in the template, that gives us a prompt, which we feed into an LLM. That's a very basic chain. When you start to get more advanced, you may say things like, when the result of calling an LLM is this, we may want to send it over to this other LLM with a different prompt. Where if it's something else, we'll send it to a different one. And that's where we start getting these slightly more intelligent agents. And many of these agents are just controlled by the logic that we're providing, and many of the agents are controlled by prompts that we're giving it that are feeding into an LLM. Langchain and Langchain.js take care of a lot of that under the covers for you. And then finally, as we start moving things into production, as we start needing to test and debug and figure out what's going on under the covers, we need a way to see just that. What's happening here? It can't just be magic. As developers, we need to be able to see what's going on, what routes were chosen, what prompts were created in the end, what the results came back were, and why did it break again? And for that, we need things like callbacks and ways to monitor what's going on. And again, Langchain provides a standard way to do that across all of the modules that it provides. Yeah, 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 whatever. This sounds great. Show me the code, because we're developers, right? So I'm going to take what is our third example here, where we prompt a question, where, where we ask a question, we turn it into SQL, we run that SQL to get results from a database, and we turn that into a result. What is that going to look like in Langchain.js? So at the highest level, we're going to have a loop, and it's going to call four functions, which unsurprisingly match the four steps that we just looked at. We're going to get the request from the user. We're going to turn that request into SQL. We're going to run that SQL. And then based on the SQL, we're going to get a response based on the request and the values that came from the SQL. We're going to print it out, and then we're going to start all over again. The request.js part, if you're familiar with Node.js, this is a pretty straightforward function. It's basically just saying, uh, I'm going to print out a prompt, take the input, whatever the user types in, I'm going to return that. Pretty straightforward. If you know Node.js, this looks familiar. If you don't, it should be pretty easy to figure out. Here's where we start getting into some of the bulk of it. And in particular, I want to call your attention to, to two lines. The first is that we're going to create a query model. This query model we're going to have is a Google Vertex AI query model that's using, uh, in this case, the code bison model itself. And we're going to set the temperature to 0.2. So we don't want a lot of randomness here. We want to kind of try to be as consistent and stable as possible. Then there's a bunch of lines that basically boil down to, how do I read in the prompt that I have saved in another file? We'll show you that prompt in a minute. How do I turn that into a template? How do I set up a chain that includes both this, that, that, that takes the results of a prompt, feeds it into the LLM, and gets results? And then, when I'm actually calling it, when I'm sending in the request, I'm just calling that chain, getting the result, and returning the text that came back in the result. Bunch of setup, but fundamentally, it's one line that is doing all of the work. Speaking of doing the work, but, but hiding behind that is what looks like a pretty hairy prompt here. But it's not really. Most of what this is, is describing the database schema. We then have a couple of other things that we talked about. So for example, we said, you are a database expert. We're kind of giving it the role playing, framing how we want them to, th how we want it to think about it. We're defining the schema. We're giving it instructions. Given the request, you should give just an SQL query that when run will query the database to answer the question that's given. If it cannot answer, return something else so we know we actually have an error here. We give it a couple of other kind of tweaks, like make sure you always use the fully qualified name of the table. If we were expecting relative dates, this is where we would also include what the date is, for example. We then tell it, here's the request. We have a template function to say, fill in the request here. And then we have the ask. Give me the query. So what does the query itself look like? Well, if you're familiar with running stuff against BigQuery, this should be fairly familiar to you. The biggest difference here is you know, this, this fix me that says I need to make sure we do a sanity check on the SQL. But fortunately, we as developers know what that sort of thing should look like. We're used to SQL injection attacks. We know what to look for and what to make sure we avoid. So we can put that here pretty easily. And then we run it and get a result. And we send that result back. And then what do we do with it? 
Well, we then send it to another function to get the response. Now, this looks awfully familiar to the SQL one a couple of slides back. And there's a reason for that. It is similar. It's almost the same code. The biggest difference here is that instead of using, we, we've got uh, a different model. So instead of using the code bison model, we're going to use the default model here, which is more text oriented than code oriented. And we're going to increase the temperature a little bit. We don't want it wildly hallucinating, but we do want it to be kind of flexible in its answers, let's say. Again, a bunch of code that reads in the prompt. We'll look at that one in a minute. Uh, the function itself, get response, is very similar. It, we're still doing a call. The difference this time is that we're passing in two parameters instead of one. But it's still one line that returns the result text. The prompt here is a lot simpler. We're basically saying you're a data analyst who's been given the question below and after researching the question, have concluded that the data presented in the JSON is the answer. So we need to provide a concise, complete answer to the question that could be read over the phone. And that's so we don't get a lot of strange characters. We don't get a lot, you know, we're formatting our times in a way that makes sense. We then give it the parameters that are here. We want to, here's the question. Here is our data. That's where we're going to insert it. We have our ask. Give me the answer. And we get the answer. So what does this look like if we actually run the code? Um, so I've got, uh, if you saw the schema before, it's pretty much just a, a very basic, it's a user database and modeling a bunch of chat messages that the user may have posted. So we may ask, how many users do we have? It generates what looks like an incredibly reasonably reasonable looking SQL query. We run that query, we get an answer back of five, and we return back, according to our records, we have five users. Notice it even spelled out the word five for us in this case. When did John Doe last log in? Again, perfectly reasonable looking query. It even figures out the fact that we may be asking for their full name, not their username, which are two different fields. It returns back uh, a structure that is a BigQuery timestamp that is you know, standard ISO format, but when we feed that into our second prompt, we're getting back a result telling us that it was on January 1st, 2023. Again, human formatting from a data structure, something that was discrete and clearly defined into a format that we can read out over the phone. So let's wrap this up. What are the conclusions I want you to take away from this? The first, please, please remember, LLMs are not a source of truth. But we can use them to make prompts that convert fuzzy human data into the data structures and then turn data structures into things that humans can understand. And in between, we can use the APIs, the business logic that we use today to build our products. And that every developer, every developer has these tools available to you today. We have tools like Makersuite. We have tools like Vertex AI. We have tools like Langchain that are there and helping you integrate them with your product. Most of all, most of all, I want you to remember, you can do this. Thank you very much.